That's why I believe God allows trouble, trials in our, in our lives. And you will know your real faith when trials and troubles come. So if you have your Bibles there, please turn with me to first, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'll be reading beginning from verse 1 down to verse 4. And you can follow along with me as I read these verses. Okay, if you're there and the Word of God says, Paul and Salvanus and Timotheus unto the church of Thessal Thess Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. In, in a book entitled The Pastor's Manual for Effective Ministry, the author mentioned a serious concern uh, for the United States of America's chur uh, churches. And he said uh, in this book that each year around 3,500 to 4,000 uh, churches close their doors forever. And yet only 1,100 to 1,500 new churches are started. So if you, you really see the, the statistics here, it's really, you know, you, you can see or you can say that's really alarming, right? Um, I'm not sure about here in Canada. We don't have enough or many statistics here, but I still believe that, you know, <laughs> America is our uh, neighboring country, so, and I'm pretty sure that what, ha what is happening in the States will eventually happen to the, um, our nation, Canada. I tend, to, I tend to think that churches here in Canada are going in the same direction. Well, of course, churches don't die uh, in an instant, right? You don't, you don't see a church like they're growing and and, you know, doing the ministry of God, and then the following week, they're gone. They're, you know, they, they, they die down. They, it's not happened in an instant. It's a slow process of decline and that usually precedes their death. I've been to many churches in the Philippines. I spent most of my, my life there, and some churches exist for f about 50 to 100 years. Um, however, some of these churches existed uh, for a long time and were once held vibrant, thriving, gospel preaching, and Christ-honoring churches. And now, those, church, those churches are slowly dying. And you can mostly graph the existence of these churches. From the very first start, they were alive zealous uh, zealous and growing but when they reach about like 30 20, uh, 20 to 30 years these churches started to plateau right so in the beginning of, of the birth of the church you know really growing and growing and so on but at the reach point of if they reach the 20 to 30 years they started to plateau then a few more years after, they slowly went to a decline. We have a Bible example of, of this kind of phen uh, phenomenon, actually. And Jesus Christ, through John, addressed several churches around Asia Minor. And God praised them for their good characteristics as, of, uh, as a church. But he also addressed uh, their decline and other issues of these churches. And I believe that these churches were thriving and faithful to God. 
But Jesus told the church, for example, at Ephesus, that they left their first love. He told the church at Thyatira that they've allowed perverted doctrines inside the church. He told the church at Sardis that they once held such a reputation and are now dead. Now, too many churches grow weak and many embrace errors and feel good worship. That's the trend that we can see nowadays. But I believe that if God's people will seek God and look to His Word, there's still hope, right? There's still hope. And God can turn the sick, uh, the, the sick and weak churches into vibrant and strong churches. And so the question tonight is, what does a growing church look like? Are they perfect? Do they have no issues at all? I don't think so. The church in Thessalonica, and especially the passage that we are in right now, was not perfect. They, they've experienced trials and persecutions as well as the problems inside the church. And nonetheless, the Bible says that they were a strong church. They were a strong church. And we must take note that Paul praised this church in both of his epistles for them. And Paul mentioned in his first letter how they've accepted the gospel and how they've turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. So what made them strong in a growing church? That's a good question because we can, you know, relate these principles and truths also in terms of, of the church here in Grace Baptist, at Grace Baptist Church. And we will look into tonight that uh, characteristics, the manifestation of a strong church. But before we continue, let us open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you gave to us. Lord, we thank you for the availability of your word. In many countries, don't have uh, your pure word. And Lord, we are so blessed that we can have the word of God and, and study and read. And right now we are preaching it. And so, Father, I pray that you speak into our hearts. Help us not to just go out from this place without any change at all. And so, Father, I pray that you You'll bless the church, grow the church, and we commit to you all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, to give you, an, to, so that we can understand more with regards to these verses, I would like to give a little bit of background with regards to uh, this church at Thessalonica. With, within only a few months after writing 1 Thessalonians, Paul got news, and probably from the letter carrier, of the problems unresolved by his first letter. The persecution of the believers had increased. He mentioned that in verses 3 to 10, chapter 1. False teachers ta uh, had taught the, that the day of the Lord had already come. And for them, it's like, oh, we're, we're doomed. We're still here. And the day of the Lord had come already. And some of the Thessalonian Christians had become idle as they simply waited for the rapture. And therefore, Paul de decided to write the church again to help the believers handle these difficulties. If the first, uh, so in the first few verses, Paul acknowledged, acknowledged here the, their strength as a church, and they, he indicates here a grow, what a growing church looked like. And there are three characteristics that a church of the, at Thessalon, Thessalonica manifested that we as a church, Grace Baptist Church, can also learn. So the question would be, 
what are the manifestations of a growing church? Can we see and look for ourselves that Grace Baptist Church is a growing church? Uh, first, uh, look with me in verse 3. Because a one manifestation, first manifestation of a growing church in verse 3, it says there that there is an increase of faith. An increase of faith. Now, we have to understand that the church is not a, basically a building. Well, we call this a church building, but the church is a group of believers, people, right? People. And uh, verse 3 here, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly. You know, faith is vital in Christian life. And we have to understand that. It is through faith we got saved. It is also through faith that a Christian should live. So turn with me to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. I, would, I will probably ask you to open your Bibles about four or five times, so if you can bear with me. So Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Romans 1, 17. Uh, 1, 17, the Word of God says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's the word of God here. And it's also mentioned in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and also in the book of Galatians and also in the book of Hebrews. So it's very vital. Faith is very vital in our lives. And furthermore, this is the only way to live so that God is pleased in our lives. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Word of God says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And so, if we want to please God in our lives, we should live by faith. It's plain and simple, right? We should live by faith. So, faith is very crucial as we live our lives for the Lord. And the Thessalonian believers grow or grew in their faith. That's what the passage says. And ho however, I believe Paul already expected them to grow in their faith. Right? That's, that's the same as God expects us to grow in our faith. If we say that we believe in God and we follow God and we are born again Christians, God expects us to grow in our faith. And so, it's the same with the Apostle Paul as he wrote this letter that he expected already that these Christians in Thessalonica would grow in their faith. But of course, we see here, he thanked them, he thanked the Lord because not only they, grow, they, they have this faith, but they grew their faith exceedingly, exceedingly. And to grow exceedingly means to grow beyond measure, beyond measure. Like, for example, if, if, you know, if, you, if you're working, right? right? If you're working and your boss wanted you to do something like this, and you exceeded actually his expectation. And so something like that. Uh, Paul actually, you know, expected them to grow in their faith, but... What Paul thanked the Lord is that the Thessalonian belie believers not only grow their faith, but it exceeded his expectation. And that's what he's very thankful to God, that they grow in their faith. Not only they grow in their faith, but they, grow, they grew their faith exceedingly. Now, when I, when I came to Canada, it was about in 2016, I was, I was not sure about what Grace Baptist Church looked like. I, I mean, not just the building, but, um, but the people in here. Also, I'm not sure about um, the preaching and the teaching um, of God's Word here. And of course, the ministry in general. I only knew good things about uh, the church 
because of, of my mom. She attended here already for many years now. And um, she's talking to me about, she talked to me about um, good things about Grace Baptist Church. I know that this church is not perfect. And I believe you can't find one, actually. Right? There's like an old joke that if you find a good or perfect church, don't go there. Because you will mess it up. You know, but, but this church... What I thank the Lord is that this church preaches the Word of God and the people are encouraged here to live by faith. Amen. We're not just going here and um, listening to the Word of God or something, uh, fellowshipping or something, do fancy things for something like that because that's not the will of God for our lives. Uh, this church preaches the Word of God and encourage here to live by faith. And not just to live by faith, but we are encouraged to pray that God will increase our faith. So I hope that every single one of us here are thankful to the Lord for the church like Grace Baptist Church. And many people have, want to join the church to just pick, you know, nitpicking. Uh, of the mistakes of individuals and, you know, the church. That's what they wanted to do. But those people are also are the ones who are not even active in the church. So the question is this, am I really growing in faith? If, if this church really encouraged to live by faith and to pray that God will increase our faith always, now, the question now to me as a Christian, am I really growing in faith? So when you look back and evaluate your Christian life, it is, by the way, it's really good, you know, when we evaluate our spiritual life, where are we at right now, and we're looking back, that's a good way. Um, you know, when we evaluate our life as a Christian, can, can you say that your faith increased? However, it is easy to say yes to this question, right? That's why I believe God allows trouble, trials in our, in our lives. And you will know your real faith when trials and troubles come. That's actually what, when, when that, you know, when you, when you say, oh, I have faith in God. Well, when trouble, trials and troubles come, we will see. Because that actually reveals the reality of your faith in God. So you see, for Thessalonian believers, here in our passage, it was persecutions from Judaism and also government. And to the point that their lives were at stake. And I mean, they, they, they are willing to give their lives for the Lord and for the sake of the gospel. And that's how... how as zealous they, are, they were for, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the faith that they, they have. You know, COVID hits, and sure, it could mean death. But how did you react from this kind of situation? Did you also panic like the unbelievers did? Or did we leave everything to God with regards to this situation? You know? Um, right? So if you get my point here. So the Thessalonian believers, we can see that Paul thanked the Lord and praised them because of their, not only their faith uh, grew, but also it increased exceedingly. So one manifestation of a growing church, first is there is a growing faith. There is an increase of faith. But second, not only there is an increase of faith, but in the last portion of that verse, in verse 3, there is an abundance of love for each other. Now, this is also very crucial and very important inside the church. Now, we grew up from different backgrounds, right? 
And we come here in this place, and we have in common, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, but of course, we um, tend to sometimes, you know, um, have that, this a little bit friction with each other. And so we tend to argue or something like that. But, but the Bible says here in verse 3 that Thessalonian believers, not only they have an increased faith, but in verse 3 it says there, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So this church was amazing. Not only they have a growing faith, but they also have love for each other. Now, Christian love is not just a desirable tra uh, um, trait that we should have because it is a command of God. It is a command of God. In John chapter five, uh, 15, verse 12, it says there, This is my command, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Also, the love for brethren is one of the marks of a truly born-again Christian. So turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. Now, if, if you haven't uh, read yet the, the whole 1 John, uh, I really recommend th them to you because... John is, uh, John is uh, speaking here about uh, the marks, you know, the marks of a truly born-again Christian. And that's why he said there, if you say, and then he will always make his point. So 1 John chapter 4, verse, verse um, 20, I mean, not 21. First, first John chapter 4, verse 20. If any man say, I love God and hateth his brother... He is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In verse 21, and this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So you see, this, not only it's a command of God, but also it's a manifestation of a truly born-again Christian. But that's not all. The love of Thessalonian believers for each other, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul says, aboundeth, meaning it's overflowing. It's overflowing. And I believe that they put their love not only in words, but also into action. And that's why Paul praised them for their love for each other. And again, saying you love your brother and sister is one thing, but to act upon it is another. Now there's a sophomore guy sent a love, a love letter to his girlfriend. You know, and it read like this. I'd climb the highest mountain, sail the widest ocean, cross the hottest desert just to see you. And, he, and then he said, P.S. I'll be over Saturday night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> um, it's funny, right? Uh, he... He's like um, really poetical words there, but you know. Um, so we feel bad for that girl, right? Um, there's like love that the this this guy is saying, but it's just an empty promises, empty promises. So John actually pushed for further when the things of, when, when it comes to our love for our brother, he pushed it, pushed it further. And if you can see with me, and we, if you turn, you're already in 1 John, and actually I I'd like to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And we have to understand the love 
that actually God was trying to say here for each other, for, for the brethren. In verse 16, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, how many of you wants to give their life for their friend? I'm the only one? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but, but I think when, when, when you ask to give your life for your friend, um, probably you're kind of like hesitant. Or pro- yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Something like that. But that's the love that actually God get, uh, you know, manifested and portrayed to us. Right? He gave his son, and Jesus Christ died in the cross of Calvary for us, for our sins. And so, so, that, so that we ourselves can have our place in heaven and can be with him for eternity. And that's the kind of love that God actually wants us to portray also to fellow believers. So this is the kind of love, this kind of love that John is talking about is characterized by sacrifice. Sacrifice. It is a love based on the will, not on emotions. Because emotions can, your emotion can easily sway you or lead you into different things. But it is a matter of will. You love the person because you will love that person. You chose to love the person. You know, you have husbands and wife here. It's like, um, if you ask, well, I'm not that um, long enough to say something, but I have three years of experience when, with regards to, to with, with my wife. And for sure, I, I would really agree with, with those who have been mar- those who are married for many years, that sometimes you feel like you don't love your, your wife. You know, it's like emotion-wise, right? But because you choose, you chose to love that person, you know, that's one thing. It's, uh, that's another thing. So this is kind of love. It's not, a feeling, um, it's not a feeling subject to the whims of our conscience. It is a decision to love another despite of the cost. And that is the love that what John is telling here, to love others, to love your brethren. However, laying down our lives for others usually doesn't mean dying. Sometimes, if God called you to do that, yes. But often, it costs a little more than stopping what we're doing in entering into someone's world of need. If you see someone, your brethren, have a need, you give your time. Right? How much do you love your, our, your brethren? How do you think? Um, and how do you think you can show it in action? Like, for example, I'll give you an example. When you help someone here inside the church, that shows your love to a brother or sister. Like, for example, it's, it's someone is leading a ministry or needs help someone in a ministry and you help him or her so that the work will be lighter, that's love in action. And even though it's not your job, but you choose, you're willing to help anyhow, that's love in action. When you say encouraging words to your brother and sister who struggles, that's love in action. However, our love should not only manifest to our fellow brothers and sisters because that's not only the parameters of our love that God told us. Yes, you show love especially in the household of faith. But we should also, we should also love others, especially those who are lost. So when you help flyering, actually, and when you help out bringing the gospel to the lost, 
And especially here, we, we are reaching the city of Siri with about, let's say, 650,000 people. Many of them don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. But you, if you just look into that, for us here, the number of our, our attendance here is not sufficient. And that's why we're encouraging every, every single individual, if you are able to, to bring the gospel to the lost. That's love in action. When you give to missions, and our, we have a new um, ministry, our mission of love to the poor, that's love in action. Right? Because you are giving a sacrifice there. So what, what is it, what, so what is the first manifestation of a growing church? First, there is an increase of faith. And second, there is an abundance of love for each other. But we have the third. And let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 4. And the Word of God says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Ye endure. In the first letter of the Apostle Paul, there are three characteristics of the church that he mentioned. It is their work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. This young church had endured much persecution in their short existence. And through it all, they were steadfast in their faith. And because of this, they were a great influence on others. And in fact, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says there that they were in samples, meaning they become an example to every believer around the churches in the provinces of Achaia and in Corinth, in Macedonia as well. And so they became a pattern for a, a kind of a church that is really a growing church. So even their lives were at stake of following the Lord and doing His will. They were, pa they were patient and always have the constant expectation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the third manifestation of a growing church. There is a constant expectation to a Lord Jesus Christ. They understand that Jesus Christ is coming soon. In like manner, we Christians should have a constant expectation that Jesus could come at any moment, at any time, right? Because that's what he tells us to do. Well, probably you would say to me, sure. It's, it happened already for, for uh, 2,000 years ago. You know, after, uh, actually after Jesus Christ, you know, went back to heaven. That's the last days, my friend. And it's been going for many, many years, even until this day. So Jesus Christ can really can come at any moment, at any time. And the wise thing that we should do is to be ready for his return. And why we should have a constant expectation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, of course, it's, it's, uh, I'll give you several reasons here. Number one, it keeps us from sin. Because that's John told believers in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in him, in Jesus Christ. You know, the hope that Jesus Christ will come again, he said, purifieth himself even as he is pure. So we're kind of living our, we, we are living our life for the Lord Jesus Christ keeping short accounts of sin, making sure that you will not go like, oh, this is rapture. Wait, Lord, I'll pray. Well, not like that, but we are ready to be taken by God in, in an instant. Number two, 
it builds our patience. And that's what verse 4 says here. Because of their expectation, always they have a constant expectation. They're, they're, even though they are, they are experiencing trials and tribulations in their lives, Paul said here that their patience increased. Not only that, number three, it gives a new perspective when it comes to trials and troubles in life. Now, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, and then every time I read that, well, there's a portion of passages there and a few verses there. It's really, really encouraging, especially if you undergo tribulation and or trials or even struggles in life. And the Apostle Paul said, therefore, our light affliction, and I actually circle that because it's, for me, it's impossible to say a light affliction of all that the Apostle Paul have experienced. You know, people stoning at him and even leaving him for death, shipwrecked, he was bitten, right? And all the persecutions that he encountered. And he said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now for him, his trials and tribulations here in this world, because he is constantly expecting that Jesus Christ will come again, for him, life here is but a moment. Not only that, the trials and tribulations are light. Fourth, it gives us rest, peace. Are you troubled? Have you find yourself now um, not in a resting place? Verse 7, in our text in 2 Thessalonians verse seven, chapter 1, verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now with that expectation, we can have peace and rest in God. And lastly, number five, it uproots us from this world. Because everything that we have here, we, we will leave on earth, right? Well, Job told them, naked I came here, and naked I will see, you know, See, see the Lord. No, nothing will, there's no, nothing or single, um, even your pen, you, you will not, um, or something whatsoever, valuable thing that you have here on earth, you can't bring it in heaven. And that's, so that's why it removes us from our horizontal view, our view here for the world, and looking always unto Jesus. So these are just, you know, few of many benefits when we constantly expect the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when, when someone is coming to your house, and let's say it's a very important person, what do you think you will do? Well, of course, you... Most of the time, you, you will prepare, right? You'll prepare yourself. You, um, you see the, all the um, things that around the house, you make sure that it looks good. You prepare yourself. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the ten virgins? I, I, I probably assume that all of us here are familiar with that. Well, I don't have the time to really explain, but the overall thrust of the parable is that Christ will return at any moment, at any time, and that his people must be ready. You know, you have this five, uh, foolish, five um, foolish virgins and the wise virgins, and they, those are the wise virgins. They actually have the opportunity to meet the bridegroom. So that's also, we don't, we don't want to be in a situation of those unprepared five virgins, don't we? 
We may be working, eating, sleeping, or pursuing uh, leisures, ac leisure activities in, here in this world. And whatever it is, we must be doing it in a way that we don't have to make things right. You know, like getting more oil when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. We make sure that we, we prepare. So my last questions would be this. Do you have an increased faith? Do you have an increasing love for brethren and others? And do you have a constant expectation for Christ's return? You know, if you're not saved, if you're listening here right now, and to those who probably you who are watching online, if you're not saved, my friend, you need to be ready. Because, for example, where if you're not saved and Jesus Christ will come this night, then you have to be ready, be prepared for his coming. You need to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. But, of course, for us Christians, let us not allow Satan, the world, and also our flesh to prevent us from growing growing if you say yes to all these things then i believe that we have a growing church here in grace baptist church so let's let's uh, keep growing in faith let's keep growing in love and in hope in jesus christ so those are the manifestation of a growing faith let us all pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you gave to us. And Lord, if you would allow us to search our hearts and help us, dear Father, to increase our faith and love and hope in you. And so that we will not be unprepared when Jesus Christ will come again. So Father, I pray that you would bless your word in the, in the hearts of your people. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's word.